Hey, what's up, guys? Lucas Burnley here, along with my co-host, TJ Schwartz, and you are listening to the Edge and Flow podcast. Um, both of us, I think, are on the edge maybe right now. Uh, it's been a hectic couple of weeks, man. Uh, TJ, I'm going to let you kick it off, man. You're fully in turn production. Turns are not only in production. They We, sh- we sold since the last podcast. We sold the first batch. And they Boom. are being delivered to customers right now. So today I just scrolled through the tracking numbers in my like shipping app thing. Uh-huh. And it's like anybody who's domestic and who isn't like in Hawaii or something is not anybody, but a lot of them are getting them today. But the next few days, they're probably all going to land domestically. So that was excited that was to see quick. what people think. Yeah, me too, man. I, I've seen like a few uh, pop up in the Facebook group already. Uh, so that's pretty rad. Hopefully that will keep happening. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, man. Okay. That's first run, first collaboration, first run done. Mm-hmm. Any big insights? Like we want to recap it. I, I'm super happy with how it went, dude. I really am. Um, it, the only thing that I was worried about was the sheaths because yep. everything else is pretty, pretty in line, but like without handles, I wondered if it would have consistency with the retention. Mm-hmm. And the one I sent you had very, wiggly retention because yep. of we didn't talk about this on the pod i guess yeah we, sure uh, we might not have okay Definitely i mean if didn't. we did we can recap it anyway yeah um i sent you one knife prior yep. to launching it to get like the just designer feedback and stuff and the sheath body knife that i made your sheath with was not tumbled but the actual knife was and yep. so without handles the knives that have chamfers that haven't been tumbled are like really sharp chamfers like crisp mm-hmm. And obviously the tumbled ones are slightly right radius. And so the sheath only indexing on steel and no handles. If it's made on a knife that's not tumbled and then a tumbled knife goes in, there's actually a surprising amount of wiggle. Like yeah. I was, I was amazed that it made that much of a difference. Yeah. Cause we're talking a really nominal, nominal, blah, 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 nominal amount of change from tumbling. Yeah. But with, with molding Kydex off of hard features, every little bit, like, really yeah. comes into play yeah and so i i went ahead and tumbled one really hard or the sheath knife the the sheath mule i tumbled mm-hmm. really hard so that it would have radiuses even tumbled it a little bit more yeah. so that you would have like actual interference fit yeah and then super I, smart i was actually a little worried about that i was wondering if i was going to have to take like a dremel and like do even more relief on the knife to where it would have even more of an interference fit uh didn't have to i made like 20 of the sheaths and then I went and tested them all. I was testing them as I went, but I wanted to make sure that putting each individual knife in each individual sheath yep. would not, I wouldn't see like variables starting to pop up across numbers. Didn't have any issues and I was really happy. So I hope people are happy with the retention because that, that was a hurdle I saw coming that didn't come. So mm-hmm. that was good. It is, it's really hard on thin knives in general because every little bit, it can just totally change the feel of the sheath. Yeah. So... Even the one you sent me, the prototype, like it, it had wiggle, but completely within like, like actually better than like a lot of Kydex I've felt. So it had a little bit of wiggle, but the retention itself was still good. So if these are better than that, I think that is, that's awesome. Well, I, it should be similar retention, but should be zero wiggle, if not just very, very tiny amount. Nice. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was, I was really happy. And, and those sheaths just came together quickly and I went ahead and made all those, uh, kind of Dalton's basically, we kind of split and I was like, I'm going to work on getting all these turns out and he's working on maintaining other, other models. Um, so we ended up being a cool shop experience, him and I kind of really dividing and conquering and went super well. That's awesome. One just, thing I was curious about was, um, I know that you had some options that people could order mm-hmm. any takeaways from the options. Um, well, the sheath options is what you're talking about. Cause there yep. were no options on the blade. They were yep, tumbled. But sheath, yeah. Carry yeah. options. And, and so inside of ordering the knife, you had to choose what you wanted for the color of the sheath and mm-hmm. for the eyelets, whether brass or black oxide. And okay. so it was just a range, like a rainbow of sheaths, which I thought was really fun. That's pretty um, fun. And it, it, it worked really good. So it, I don't fully do that. So my other models are standard with a black sheath. Right. With black eyelets, but you can opt up to the full custom sheath. 
And the only reason I did that is we are targeting being able to turn knives around pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so the verbiage on the website doesn't yet read this because we're not caught up yet. But what it's going to be is like, if you just want it as soon as possible, get the black sheath Mm -hmm. because it's the one thing we can't pre-make if you're going to be doing like different eyelets and colors. Yeah, you don't know what it'll be. Yeah. But with this knife, we're not, it's a little bit of a different model and there is no customizability on the tang on the knife. So I'm like, let's just throw in full customizability on the sheath. I think it went really well. It was, it was smooth. I think that's cool. Well, and it kind of keeps like you're finding an area that you can kind of keep one, one level of customization in place. I, I think that's pretty fun. Mm-hmm. And so I love, col- I love colored Kydex in general. Yeah. Um, me you too. know, I think it's pretty sweet. So, and I, I, uh, yeah, so I launched it and it said, I tried to put in like bold red that like these knives are complete, they're sharpened and they're ready to roll, but just be aware. It's going to be like a few business days because yeah. you are ordering a custom sheath. Um, and so luckily it went smooth and nice. a couple of business days later they were out. So no sense of like a balance of color. Like, was there a favorite color? No, honestly, I, I did have the data in mind cause the early days of the Overland, it was all wide open like that. And it's mm-hmm. like what I found was a lot of my early Overland sales were based on YouTube reviews. So like Nick Shabazz oh, did a with a sage sheath and a brass eyelet. And it was like an overwhelming amount of that. And I was sure. like, oh, maybe that's the standard. And then as that tapered off, then it would migrate. And another YouTube video would come out with a different sheath. And I found that it was like people would see something and some someone would have something like an influencer and they would gravitate towards that. But it could never really nail down like a favorite. I think black on black always sells well um, just because it's classic. Yeah. Um, but it's like a range. It really is a rainbow. Nice. Mm-hmm. Love it. Um, okay. So what is, what is next step for turn? So we already machined the next batch. It's sitting in the shop um, waiting to join another batch of overlands to go to heat treat, which we still have to machine the overlands. Um, like I said, I'm laminating these in with these other models. So it's not just like all hands on deck on the next batch, like as soon as possible. Um, it's just going to fit in in the next weeks. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just going to have to fit in when it does. And then we'll do another drop. Nice. Mm-hmm. Love it. But yeah, Consistency. It, yeah. Yeah. Dalton ran the, I ran all the first turns and I ra- made the first batch of sheaths. I do think I like that. And then Dalton ran the second batch of turns on the machine and he'll probably file in on the sheath. So it's like one thing I do like that I've heard, I can't remember who said it, but it was like, as the owner of the company or like the product development guy, I like to, I like the business model being, I'm going to work on things that are either new or broken yep. if I can. Yep. Um, so it's like, I want to see 40 sheaths come out and I see how every single one comes out. So I know like that we didn't have problems somewhere in the design. Yep. Um, and yeah. So, yeah. And then theoretically you can step back. This is something that like Maddie and I have talked about quite a bit, which is as the process changes. So like, like talk about shipping or something like that, where you have a process, our shipping process is no longer a process that I developed and am competent in. In an ideal world, I think you actually like step back occasionally and like relearn the new system at at our scale Mm -hmm. because if like if i had to ship right now like it would take me quite a while to like figure out what that process was if i didn't have maddie handy to do it yeah um yeah and then obviously like you scale to a point where that's not relevant anymore but in early days i think that's pretty key no i i noticed that like dalton's doing all the assembly so like scales on knives you know the different hardwares and and things and i stepped in and assembled a few because he was doing something else and he had like the drawers are set up. We have all the colors, all the different, you know, options mm-hmm. labeled and stuff. He had them exactly how he likes them. And I was like kind of lost. And I was yeah. like, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah. Like you can just do it. Yeah. And then, uh, so that's probably the department that he's like completely taken is assembly. Mm-hmm. It's like, nice. it's Dalton's little territory. Nice. Are you sure. having him do, are you having him do like any order and op sheets? Order like, and having him like, yeah, like write down process, like process sheets. Um, I haven't really done that. We have prints that we've been putting out in the shop, which we need yeah. to do more of. Um, process. No, we don't have a whole lot of that. Um, just that's curious. Something, 
there's a couple of processes that we documented like uh, on the style, there was a couple things that was like, you have to go through a couple of menu screens to do a couple of weird mm-hmm. things in weird scenarios. Uh, we documented some of that, but like, as far as making the knives, um, besides putting like notes straight on machines, like on our yeah. sandblaster, what PSIs, and then like on the laser, we have fixturing for that and there's some information. Um, but no, not, not really robust process sheets. Like yet. assembly might, sheets. Might, yeah. Might be a good idea. And it, and it might not matter, but it's one of those things where you can look at it occasionally like i always wonder if i develop something um fully step away from it a year goes by would i have would i have set it up that way now Mm -hmm. and so i think there's a lot of processes that you can that essentially can become dated even though they were a good way to do it at the outset Mm -hmm. and this could fully be like a weird like ADHD over analysis kind of response thing. But that's why I've always written stuff down. I can like go back and like, Oh, how was I doing it here? Okay. Um, you know, it's, I'm running into it in like weird areas now. Um, with like, I've been having trouble with anodizing for a while, which is Mm. really strange, but there's enough variables that have changed in my overall process that it, I've been having a hard time figuring out like what step is now creating a problem. Mm-hmm. Had I written down kind of all of the initial processes, I think I would be in a better spot to like diagnose yeah. it. Yeah. So no, that's a, yeah. Jay Pearson, Pearson work holding. He's, mm-hmm. he's a beast at that kind of thing. And he's, he's made the point that it's like you get it out of your head and on paper, then you can allow yourself to forget it. Yep. And then you can just, Re- go back to it whenever you need it, which is step back into like, it. Takes the weight off your mind. Um, no, that's that's wise. Like we done, we've done a couple of things, but not enough. We should do more of that. Yeah. Well, especially if he's starting to like make changes to process or like organization and stuff. Yeah. It's like the date a change is made, the date, like just like I always think that stuff over a long time horizon is probably pretty valuable. You're like, when did we start doing it this way? Mm-hmm huh, okay, you go back and you're like, oh, 2023, like, okay, we switched. We, like, co- totally reorganized the pick and pull system or whatever. Yeah. One one thing, one crisis, not crisis, but one thing we averted along those lines is, like, so the first confidants were bevel ground mm-hmm. on a seatman by tactile, mm-hmm. which is great. And then we went to milling the bevels. And so mm-hmm. the, the plunge ends up being a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was worried that our sheaths were going to have conflicts with... Right the new sheaths being made to the new milled bevels. If someone orders, a lot of people actually order sheaths from me for knives they've ordered like six months ago. Um, And I was worried that I was going to have to set up on the website, like pictures of like, what one do you have? Right. Which generation? And I, I, that felt messy. And I always like kind of grinded my teeth over that. But what we did is we took one of the ground bevels and we put it in the sheath that had been made on the new plunge. And we covered it in dicum and we just ran it in and out of the sheath like a whole bunch of times to see if we were getting rubbing on the dicum and we didn't. And so luckily the sheaths will work. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Generational changes is hard. I always think about that. Like I've been thinking about a gen two Overland for a while now, but it's like, there's a few things that I have ideas for, but it's like, shoot, like it would have to be a new model and like a complete next generation because like, sheaths are going to change i mean it would just it changes it, well complete that's like, turnover that that seems like a process that you can probably start to develop now and this this is something that i've always struggled with which like early on custom I, every run of knives i did even of the same model i was always changing but i was doing everything by hand mm-hmm. so it was i would change my pattern and then the next knives are different but i was hand making everything so it didn't matter kind of I realize now that there are essentially like it's probably you strip it down to like two levels of change. Like you have one level of change that only increases like either maybe there's three. So like optimization of how you make it, but it doesn't physically change the design. Um, a design that improves the function right? But doesn't change like fixturing or some other external dimension. So like it could be like on a folder, you're like, I'm going to add 
weight relieving pockets on the inside and I'm going to add a lock bar insert. It's like both of those are new steps and like one of them is a new component, but it, it exists inside of your current model. Mm -hmm. And then the third is you have a visual change a true to the model. Change. Yeah, yeah, which is usually the one that really starts to change how you make it, how you sheath it, how other parts work with it. Um, and I feel like there's probably a some like reasonable mm -hmm. level of like when and why to change. And at what point, yeah, is it just like a fully new model? You're like, I've had the Overland for five years. We're now releasing the Gen 2. The first one is completely gone. But like then you have like you've had a long timeline to like at least produce the one that's efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I have thought about like if I were to do that, and this is hypothetical, this is not like immediate plan, but I thought like would it be a Gen 2 or would it be the Overland 2 and you have both? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a Overland question, two. you know. Well, and the question, I think the answer in there probably is like what are the nature of the changes? Well, I don't want to dig into it right now. Honestly, right. like I'm keeping it under my hat because yeah, I have some thoughts. you don't have to, but I think that's yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah, it is. Right? Because all of a sudden, is it like, is it an evolution and is it a different model? Or is it just like some minor tweaks, but like yeah. someone who isn't super knowledgeable would look at it and think it was the same knife. And, and also, is it all around better or am I making decisions that hurt it in other ways yeah. where the, they might prefer the original over it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if it's all think, around. I guess like the Quiken and the Squid probably have there are generations. So I think there's either three, there's maybe three generations of Quiken and three generations of squid. Those I'm getting ready to do the second generation of tuna. Nice. Um, but in the tuna for right now, all of those changes will be kind of uh, operational changes. Mm. Like just small improvements. Like yeah. I want to add a lock bar insert. I want to change, Maybe I want to switch to bearings. I want to, you know, it's not really like the visual components of the knife. Yeah. 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 Dude, being efficient's hard. It's really hard for me. I had a, I had a realization just like in the last month actually about efficiency because like I've had a few people look at the big picture of what I'm doing and be like, oh, that looks efficient. Sure. I like disagree when I hear that. And it, I think it's because each component of what I'm doing individually each one is actually kind of slow by my the way it looks to me sure but i think an efficiency that we've gained in our shop that it's like the shop is more than a combination of its elements in right. that what i did when we first started was it was like if a process was reliable and stable and not fully efficient what i could see it possibly being i would just move on to the next thing and make it reliable and stable and so okay. it was like the only priority was reliable and stable and efficiency was like not really that important to me up to now. And I think each step being reliable and stable creates like a macro efficiency where I haven't been chasing things. Like it just seems like things just work. Um, and so it's like right. now I'm actually thinking about making things efficient for what feels like the really the first time. And everything up to now has just been like, make it as reliable and stable as possible. Yeah, um, I think that makes sense. I mean, th at the end of the day, there's like no, like I think in, like efficiency is like almost a trap in certain ways because mm -hmm. being efficient in one area almost assures that you're not efficient in another area. Yeah. So figuring out what layers or l like what elements of efficiency are valuable is one thing that really... Uh, I think comes into play. That's like some of the stuff like we talked about last time, which is I'm changing my working method based on my new availability of time, which is significantly less. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the projects that can be efficient inside of a certain time period that deliver a certain amount of revenue. That's like it. That's its own thing. Yeah. You're, right? you're looking at it like a cellular level, like this Basically. block, this product, this block of time. Yes. Like it, it's like a cell in yeah. amidst the other things you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. It's pretty fun. Yeah. It's been, it's been a really, uh, 
kind of satisfying process. And it's been crazy. Oh, you know, one thing we can talk about too a little bit is I just got back from the USN show. Um, and so I was getting, I was like getting ready for that show, uh, got ready for it really quickly. Um, it's interesting, man. Shows, shows are changing, right? The customer base is changing. The makers inside of these shows are changing. It's really, it's really interesting to see. I haven't like, I think it's almost too early to tell like where some of the changes are going, but it's palpable. Mm. It's a trip. Yeah. This was the 14th USN. You need to talk more about it. I want to hear more about USN. We haven't really chatted that much, man. So I had done, I had done the first nine USNs in a row. And then with moves and babies, like started missing. I think I've missed three total out of all of them. Um, and I was super nervous, uh, going back to this one. Um, I knew a bunch of makers that had dropped the show. Um, having, it's weird. Cause you work in these rotations where you like, you go to shows and you, people are expecting to see you and then they go to the show. And when you miss shows, sometimes I feel like it's there. The fear is that people forget very quickly. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, that was not the case, which the f- Saturday morning, like when the doors opened, I was so it's just like just like relief and gratitude because it felt like it felt normal. Like we had mm. a huge rush to the table. There was a line. We did our we did our pre-sales, like so everything sold out from the like first come, first serve. Um but it like it put something I think I like or like put something into perspective for me a little bit, which is like we as makers, like I think there's there is like a a certain expectation to the show to like provide you customers right and like i over the last couple of years i've i've really started to view this differently which is like you need to put in the work as a maker to make sure that your base is there and that it supports the show this might be like Maybe people don't love that as a, as a comment, but it's like, I don't know, man. It's just how I feel. Like I look, I'm like early days, USN, I owe the show like in a, in a weird way. So that the show came from the forum, the forum at that point was the outlet. This is pre Instagram, you know, like before makers were really using Facebook. So you show up at this show in Vegas with a kind of a captive captive like audience of people who are already familiar with your work and are in the same community as you. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of makers of my generation that that show played like a pretty big part in their early success. Mm -hmm. Only speaking for myself, like I can 100% say that. Interesting. Um, yeah, so, Jesse, Jesse says the same thing, which we already mentioned, but Jesse Drost. Um, I missed it. I missed that. Like, yeah, I came in right after that. I know. I didn't even really understand the gathering when I came in because it was like USM. Like, what is this? Yeah, you what know? is it? Interesting. Yeah. And I wonder, I don't know, man, like right now there are so many shows. Um, they're like, we've talked about this a little bit. Like I'm seeing fatigue in makers. I'm seeing fatigue in collectors and I really don't like it. Um, I don't know what the solution is. I know, I kind of know how I'm interacting with it, which is like my basic plan is I'm going to reduce the amount of shows that I'm doing even more than I was. And I'm going to focus on making the shows that I can go to like really uh, fun. Nice. And try to hit it really hard. And I did that with USN, but it was a short timeline. So I didn't have a ton of time to prepare. But in that time that I had, I just, I tried to go as hard as I could to make mm-hmm. things that I knew people would really like. And I think it really paid off. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, man, I don't know. It's interesting. I had a, I had a 13 hour drive on the way in and a 13 hour drive on the way home. And I spent the entire time thinking and mm-hmm. 
it was different thoughts headed down as opposed to coming back up, which was pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, I can relate to that. I've driven to Vegas a couple of times <laughs> and had the same experience, dude. It's those shows and meeting these people and like going to these events, like it's so yeah. transformative. It's just, it's irreplaceable. It um, is whatever, whatever show is like the big show of the decade or whatever. Yeah. Um, whatever it is, like you, you just got to be there and it's not just about making money. It's not just about the knives. Like, it's just, like you said, the energy that you inject into yourself when you talk to these people, see that, see the customer's faces. Like, yep. it's just, it just supercharges things. You know what I mean? Uh, it really, it, it really, me. it really does. Um, I, I've been thinking about that more lately, which is like, there are things, processes, uh, that we hold on to because they are like traditional and shows, shows are one of those that kind of fall into that category for me. But like, I guess the, my, my original thought with this is like figuring out like what you are holding on to that actually has value versus like you're just doing it because it's like muscle memory Mm -hmm. shows are one where it could easily become muscle memory. You're just like, Oh, this is like how I do it. I go to these shows. If you're not changing, in my opinion, if you're not changing the shows that you're doing, if you're not changing kind of the product that you have available, I think there's some stagnation there. So I think like for myself looking at it, I'm like, Oh, like, I'm starting to tailor the product that I bring to the different shows. I'm, I'm really trying to focus on having the bandwidth to like connect to customers in a, in a more meaningful way. And that actually came from going to shows without any product. Mm -hmm. uh, But I had to like fully step away. Like blade show is a great example. And we've talked about this so much, which is like you go to blade, you don't have product. You spend all your time talking to people and I felt like I accomplished as much as when I go and sell product. Obviously it's different, but finding there's like this balance point where I didn't burn myself out going into the show. I like left some, I left some energy on the table kind of so that when I showed up, I was like, I was psyched. I was psyched to go out to dinners with people like spend time. It's just like, I don't know. You can't replace that with social media. Does yeah. it, you know, a little bit like you have conversations, you can have, you can know people, but it's almost an extension of the forum where it's like, it's a good baseline. If you have a group on Facebook and those people are going to show it's like, they at least have an in to know you and to like yeah. be aware of your work. It's, yeah. you know, but yeah, th- there's just no replacement for like human interaction at yeah. some point. I mean, you can approximate it many yeah. different ways, but you just can't get there all the way like just meeting people going to the pit going to you know a restaurant with a group of guys or whatever like it's just irreplaceable and yeah it i'll I'll be going to shows forever like even if like i'm about to enter an era where i'm going to start selling knives at shows yep even if that runs its course i'll still return to going to shows like on foot like it's just i can't not do it honestly as long as you're i think that there's a point like you and i at this point in our lives like we are industry this is pretty much like in our mm-hmm. blood. We have enough yeah. years where it's just like you're too connected. Yeah. Um, and that's how I feel like, yeah, there might be a time where you're like, Oh, shows or, or you're going to certain shows with product and you're going to other shows for social, mm-hmm. um, long tangent on that. But one of the big takeaways, you hear people every show talk about how the show wasn't good. Right. Like my question is always like, what did you do to make it good? Mm -hmm. Like, how did you show up for the show? How did you show up for your collectors? And is it where in lies the problem? Mm hmm. Right. Like, yeah. And and not to say like shows can have bad attendance shows there. There's things that can happen. But at the end of the day, man, like I've got 20 years of doing knife shows like very I don't know of any shows that are bad for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone's always having a good show. Someone's having a bad show. Yeah. So like where, where do you want to be in that spectrum? Yeah. You got to kind of show up to play ball. Like it's, it's not just like a, my presence at this show is all that is required of me. You know, it's like, yeah, you got to put in the work. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I think blade is pretty funny because like, there's a point where you're like, 
you see, you see like the old cats sitting there reading a book with a table full of knives. And at that point, like maybe some of them are, that's the thing. They're happy doing that. They're there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're not there hustling. Yeah. Right. Right. There's some, there's some steps. Got to hustle. I, I'm I'm absorbing a lot of this every time you talk about shows, (laughs) because I'm, I'm within a month now of doing my first show as a full on like booth and stuff. So I'm, I'm just internalizing everything and thinking about the approach and it's, it's nerve wracking and exciting. I mean, nerve wracking is weird because it's like there isn't a huge downside like it's i can drive to it it's not that hard it's a two-day show it's like i'm not like breaking the bank to go down there and do this in the first place but it's nerve wracking in that it's like part of me doesn't know what to expect but that's you i actually think that you're in a really beautiful position with blade west essentially it's a local show there is a huge amount of potential in that show some of which you can actually help to like actualize, right? Scale wise, it's still at a point where you're going to be able to like connect with other makers, actually hang out with customers. And I think it's the type of show where you will develop new customers just because they walk by. And that is one takeaway from the shows that I've been to recently that, um, that process I feel is happening less. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of shows, the makers who are known, they're fine, but the collectors go to those makers, they buy their things and then they go to hang out somewhere else. Yeah, They're not like old school blade show. Like my table didn't close until Sunday when they start rolling up the carpets because I was waiting on that person to walk by and yeah. just happen to buy a knife that I feel like at the small kind of like tight, like real enthusiast shows, I think it's happening less. Yeah. I think with blade West, I think you still have that process. Like you have people that are like, Oh, Hey, a knife show. Like I'm going to roll in on a, yeah. on Saturday and check it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the new thing on the block. It's only yep. the second year. Yep. And what, what I'm excited about is that blade show West has had like kind of a spotty history. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, been a roller coaster to say moved the least. around and, and then it seemed like you you were there with me last yep. year it seemed like everybody in the room was like yeah this yeah. is it you this just is, feel it the roots just went down like yeah. it is the overall vibe and yeah, so big sigh basically ho- yeah and hopefully enough people went home and talked like that to all their maker friends to all their collector friends that they're like well i'm gonna be there next year and that's yeah. like the vibe i got walking out last year was that like a lot of people had messaged me like, how was it? Was it worthwhile? Like, and a lot of people ducked out. It weren't, you know, were skeptical because of like the patchy history of Blade Show West. And I think it's got like this new street cred that it didn't ever have before. So yep. I- I'm curious to see what that, if that materializes this year. Well, and you also have to remember, like there has to be, there has to be open doors in the industry and like at a certain level or generation of maker, you just start to run into this, like, Oh, I want I want the four hour one day show. I want mm-hmm. the invitational. I want the show where I can sell, you know, high dollar open bids. But as, as a new maker or someone who's like building their demand or their brand, having shows where you can just go in and do the work and like network is super, super valuable. And so like shows should not be viewed through the same lens which I feel like makers kind of do right. New makers, Mm -hmm. old makers. It's like new makers assume they need the same show that like the well-established makers do Mm -hmm. and well-established makers will kind of discount or dismiss Mm -hmm. like a new show because it's Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to go back to doing two days of a trade show. Yeah. And I, I I just think there's a lot of value to be found by like switching it up to people, you know? So yeah, it's it was it was really good. I actually have a huge stack of notes from USN just from just from being there and like just getting psyched on the show, on the process. I had Joey with me, um, which is like the first time he's done a show with me in in a few years. And so it was just it was just super fun, man. Felt yeah. like felt like energy. People slept outside in the line. They lined up, I wanna say I think someone said they had lined up at like seven or eight in the morning the day before 
Wow. And I know people were lining up at like two o'clock in the afternoon the day before. Wow. So that's epic. So how do you have a bad show? Like there's people that are literally sleeping outside. Why are they sleeping there? Yeah. And the anticipation's there. Yeah. That's awesome. No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting pumped, dude. It's, yeah, it's, it's like I'm rounding the corner to thinking about it. Cause like I got a few like ducks in a row, got the hotel book, got the things that yep. needed to be done like months ago. Yep. And then I put the plan in place that I'm like, the plan to get to the show with product is exactly the same plan I have to get inventory set up in our shop yep. for like turnaround quick times. Yep. So it's like me working on the normal things that I'm doing in the shop is show prep is right show now. Prep. And so That's I didn't amazing. have to worry too much about it. But now within a month, now the final details of the booth, the final details of getting the product down there safely in, in terms of like cases or how am I ta- how am I doing that? Like now I'm like starting to focus on some of those small things um, yeah. and I'm excited. I, I have a list right in front of me that I wrote down like over the last week of like things that I need to be aware of. Nice. Um, so I'm- let's do let's do a little bit of a session, like just a little game plan thing, because mm-hmm. we've got list and it's sometimes it's just like the little convenience things that you can bring to mm-hmm. a show or they make a lot of difference. Um, yeah. A couple recently that I keep telling myself is I never want to go to a show without gifts mm. because I like to give stuff to people. Um, having stuff for kids especially is awesome because you go to a show and kids for the most part are not allowed to touch things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you have like a patch to hand over, or like some, you know, like the Nathan's knife kits from CRKT yeah. take yeah. like 15 of those. And they're just, it's just a fun, you know, yeah. way to connect oh. with people who are used to clever. like no one acknowledging them. That's clever, dude. I like that. And I'm change. Gonna, I'm lots of change. Lots of fives. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Cha- ca- cash and change. That's something that I haven't even begun to think about. So it's I need, like, to, yeah. need to do that. Joey always gives me a hard time because I like to price in fives. Mm-hmm. He's like, dude, just just end in twenty. Like, stop it. Don't don't do twenty five dollars. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't do three twenty five. Yeah. I'm like, but I like it. It sounds better. Uh, all like, of my prices end in five. Like yeah. every single one. Yeah. So you need uh, like, honestly every product on my site. Yeah. I think. So you take like five hundred and change. You need three hundred and fives. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. It's fun. That's um. Fun. Okay. So yeah. So basically, that's like a little bit of USN. It's it's interesting, man. That show, this, the time, the timing is hard because it's Labor Day. So I really wanted to do it this year. It was a nice way to connect with people. Like, I don't know if I will be able to do that show again. Just like with kids. I I remember like five or six years ago, a couple makers dropped it. And it was, that was the reason. They're like, it's Labor Day. You like, this is, our kids are going back to school next week. You got to spend like the last month of summer prepping. Um. So I don't yeah. know, I'm trying to figure yeah. it out, but no, it's interesting. Yeah. No, I appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah. I'm, I'm deep in thought now, but any other, uh, interesting happenings, man? Well, I think like you and I, our schedules are starting to like link up again, which is pretty nice. So we should theoretically start to be back on track for recording. Yep. Um, I just, I feel like the summer, like for both of us just got so busy. Yeah. 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 Looking (laughs) forward There's the holidays and all that, but like Blade Show West is sort of the big, the big big one. And then I don't have a whole lot other than just making knives, dude, like just moving forward. Yeah. Um, That's where I'm at. I cleared the schedule for the rest of the year. Um, So not going to Blade West. Uh, Don't think I'm going to do any other shows. I'm, in this new working method, um, tr- I'm going to start trying to can shows as much as I can. Like, that's a bad sentence, but uh, essentially stage a show like 80% so that if if I have like time availability, I could get ready for a show in a shorter kind of like yeah. window. Yeah. Uh, as of right now, my next show I'm planning is Blade, Texas, which is in, like the end of February. Um, so yeah, yeah. Kind of prime the pump and kind of be prime ready the pump. to go. Yeah. Blade, Texas. I need to get, I need to get that on my radar. Yep. Um, yeah. It's supposed to be really good. Yeah. You know, and like for me again, like that's look, I look at the shows where the biggest kind of densities of like my customer base and like friends are mm-hmm. right. Texas, 
that's a very good one. A yeah, lot of people are starting to go to it. And so it's like, a, that's a great show that people are excited about where I can go and like connect, yeah. um, kind of, you know, switch around. So I think right now I am one show probably to two shows max for the foreseeable future. I just have so, so much work and such a limited amount of time. Yeah. But I think that in one to two shows a year, I can, I can create kind of like the value of doing yeah. shows. Cool. That's the plan. Cool. Um, so what else, man? What else l- do we got? A little pivot. I've got a dual yeah. monitor. I've got, it just reminded me because I've got it in my card on this other monitor. Um, I am looking at pivoting to vacuum forming Kydex. Ooh. And I think that I'm getting sucked into that vortex quickly. Oh and yeah. And we're going to, we're going to probably jump on it. Um, I think it's a perfect fit for you. I think so. Uh, I think it solves a lot of our, not problems, but like I said, we have a, we have stable and reliable. We have yep. sheaths that work every yep. time. It works. Yeah. It's now it's not efficient enough. That's what right. we've arrived at. We have an idea for a knife coming that is going to increase our Kydex demand a lot in theory. Okay. And we can't do that knife unless we're faster with Kydex. Ooh. And so it's, uh, I've got this vacuum pump in the cart. I was just doing some research and we've got to figure it out, figure it out. Um, and like I said, I ordered some material to prototype this knife. I've 3d printed it. It just can't happen without vacuum forming. So here we are. Okay. That's super exciting. Yeah. I don't I have going on process wise. Um, nothing, just more laser. Like I'm just continually learning the laser. Yeah. Cool. That's like, that's been the fun one. Um, I got a question, jump way back to the beginning of the conversation. Uh, we had talked. So one of our goals with this collab is like cross pollination. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we sent out our newsletter. Okay. To our customer base, directing them to your site. Do you have any sense of what, like how much of that was sticky? Like, did you see new people sign up for your newsletter? So that yes, yes. And yes, there was a heavy influx of names. I don't recognize. Awesome. And I, I have gotten to the point where when I launch a new model, usually the first sales are not new customers. That's kind of like what I've seen as a pattern. Mm-hmm. There are some, but usually I see the same handful of names, like right out the gate. And I'm like, I, all I have to do is scroll the orders and I can just recognize names. Right. right? This time was different. I, a large percentage i did not even remotely uh, recognize really the names um so i'm just direct assumption obviously they yeah. had to have come from somewhere else so yeah it, in that regard i think it was success That's and cool. so the only thing i'm thinking is that i'm curious because like i had even a couple of my customers say like yeah i went in to, to get one they were already gone and they were they were bummed out i told them there more were coming but i think there's also on my side i don't think my customers that have bought my knives in the past are very aggressive with the like i'm gonna wait you gotta and go refresh, now refresh, to refresh, refresh 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 right and so it's like i think some of my customers were like surprised that this was a small batch and it went quick mm-hmm. but i think your customers are so familiar with that that they right. treat every drop like that right um so i'm curious to see if that'll flip if it if like on the next round now my customers are more aware yeah that they're like oh i have to be fast like for the first <laughs> time they're really motivated to do to do that well, that, that's kind of my question too. Like there's a point where like production will satisfy probably like some of like the demand that's coming from my side. And then you will have some more organic or like, you'll just have people who are not willing to like try and jump at something, but who make it and there is stock and they're like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. I'm going to buy yeah. one today. Yep. That is, th- this is kind of a hybrid thing from the way that your business model works and the way that my business model has worked, which is like, we've always done drops. You're doing kind of made to order. And so this, this is the first time that it's kind of been, yeah, like a hybrid. Yeah. That's kind of cool. So yeah, I'm curious to see how that shakes out. No, it's been very successful. I gotta say, man, I appreciate you working with us on this. It's like, it's cool. Life was good. Early days of anything are fun, man. Like, like the blade West thing. Like you're getting in at a point where you're like, yeah, I've done. Okay. I've been to every single one of the blade Wests in salt Lake or something. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's how this collab feels. I'm like, yeah. Cause we were talking about that not too long ago with like 
some of the early guys from like CRKT where you're like, they're 30 years in now. Yeah. That's super cool. You don't yeah. get to start that very often. You're, you're the Ed Halligan of Schwartz knives now, dude. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's, I don't know. I think I'm, I can't take that cause he's way smarter than me, but <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't take that because I don't know if I'm going to be able to have the Keep designer, me going for 40 years, the designer, uh, dude, catalog that CRKT has either. It is that, that catalog is wild. Um, are you in the, are you in, um, CRKT underground mm-hmm. on Facebook? Yeah, mm-hmm. dude, there's knives that pop up in there where I'm like, if I hadn't seen the picture, I would never have thought about it again, but I knew it existed when it existed. Yeah. And just like makers and like eras and all like that. It is so deep. Like, I wonder if anyone will ever do like if they'll ever get to the point where like someone does like a, com- a complete like like a book, like a compendium yeah. of models, because it it's such a huge cross section of custom knife makers and designs and technology and models mm-hmm. that I actually think it would be like, like I've got a sick book on Jimmy Lyle, like it's super cool. The history is different. It's a different yeah. industry well, component. That's one cool thing about Sierra KT is like the fact that they're kind of cleaved to the hottest designers that they can find means yeah. they are kind of cleaved to the trends of the yeah. day. Yeah. So more so than other companies, you'll yeah. see the story of the knife industry in their catalog over time. Over time. Yeah. Whereas like a lot of other companies, like they have their vision that right. they're they're in their vision, which is good and fine. Like there's yeah. no problem. With Just that. a different but, method. Yeah. But like with Sierra KT, like they are they farm design out of the blade show type sphere. And it's like so they by nature, like they reflect that. It's interesting pretty interesting yeah yeah, dude we need all right i'm excited to start talking again um i want to get into like some trends and yeah. things that are coming down the line things that are shifting um anything else for today like we're i feel like kind of that was pretty good check-in yeah um i gotta think for just a second um that about wraps it up i'm sure I'm, as soon as i jump off of here I I'll, I'll think of something but no cool um i'm getting ready to do my next downshift we need to get back on schedule with those i've never i still can't get over i still call it red x in my head and i'm still struggling with downshift so yeah yeah (laughs) i know it i know it i went to put a red x on my calendar oh dalton and i did a downshift did i did i say that on the pod uh yeah i do i think we talked about that yep yeah briefly and yeah so that's good I, I go to put a red X on the calendar on that day. And I'm like, don't do it because it's going to, it's going to stick. Yeah. So good stuff. I though. I might take it back. Um, all right, cool. Um, guys, thank you for listening. If you are still listening, um, through all of the, <laughs> the crazy delays recently, um, if you got a turn, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, we will, uh, we'll talk next week. Yeah. All right. Take Peace. it easy.